Hi. Today, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about ionic coordination. And so we're going to start off with actually first atomic radii and then ionic radii. Then we'll get to the concept of coordination, how ions pack together. And then we'll talk about coordination numbers for geologically relevant ions. So what I'm hoping today is to uh, provide a foundation to predict relative atomic and ionic radii of uh, elements and ions based on where they are in the periodic table. Not their absolute radii, uh, but just relatively speaking. Where do they get smaller? Where do they get bigger? Um, and then to predict um, coordination of ions based on ionic radius, given ionic radii, um, compared to another coordinating ion. And then uh, j um, just to learn the main coordination uh, numbers uh, for the most common ions in, geolo in geological materials. So first let's talk about atomic radii. Okay, so the first thing is to uh, look at atomic radii with respect to the periodic table. So here's our periodic table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, so on. Within a column of the periodic table, so as you go down in this direction, the atomic radius increases. And the reason for that is because every time you jump down a row, you're adding a new shell of electrons. And so the shells get bigger and bigger and bigger, and consequently the atomic radii get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now as you go across a row, um, so for example along here, the atomic radius gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And the way I think about it is that um, as you go off to the right, as the atomic number increases, you're increasing the number of protons that are in the nucleus. And so the more protons you have, the stronger they're pulling in the electrons. The stronger they pull in the electrons, the smaller the atomic radius is. So very generally, if you look at atomic radii, the smallest ones are going to be here in the upper right-hand corner, and the largest ones are going to be here in the lower left-hand corner. So at this point, I hope you would be able to um, em embody that information uh, to uh, understand that if there were two atoms that I showed you on the periodic table, you might be able to say something about uh, their relative sizes. And so as a general rule, um, as the atomic number increases downward within a column, um, you add a shell, uh, the atomic size uh, increases. But as you go along a row, the size decreases uh, with increasing atomic number. And in general, rule number two is more important to keep in mind than rule number three. Okay, so if you look at these elements, lithium, magnesium, antimony, and sulfur, which of these would you predict to have the smallest atomic radius? And the answer is sulfur. It's more towards the upper right than any of the other elements that are here. And so at this point, I would hope you would be able to uh, predict the relative sizes of two atoms from their positions on the periodic table, just like we just did. Okay, so that tells us something about atoms, but what we need to turn to now is talking about ions. It's, it's because it's ions that pack together to make uh, minerals that make up earth materials. So the size of an atom, of course, depends on the size of the nucleus and number of electrons, um, but as an ion becomes more positive, there are fewer electrons per proton, and so the protons are pulling harder and harder on the electrons as the charge goes up and up, and as a consequence, the ionic radius gets smaller and smaller. And so, for example, if we look at, um, let's just look at sodium and calcium here, the atom sodium has a smaller ionic radius than, than calcium, but it, sodium, will it's in the column one of the periodic table, will be plus one, and so it has a corresponding decrease in ionic radius. But if you look at calcium, that's plus two, so its ionic radius is actually a little bit smaller than sodium. And this becomes really pronounced as you go over to the right in a row. So as we move along to uh, aluminum, 
uh, rather large atomic radius, little tiny uh, ionic radius, silicon, silicon becomes plus four. That's a little teeny tiny radius. And then of course, if you look at iron, okay, moderate atomic radius, its ionic radius depends on whether it's plus two, ferrous iron, or plus three, ferric iron. So the ferric iron, it's more protons per electron, fewer electrons, um, has a smaller ionic radius. Now on the other side of the, the flip side of the coin is that if you add electrons, so now you're making negative um, ions, then uh, the radius will increase. And so here, for example, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, they all have pretty close to the same atomic radius. Um, but as you add electrons, fluorine wants to have one electron become minus one, oxygen minus two, nitrogen can be minus three. Um, then the ionic radius gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the negative charge gets bigger and bigger. So you're adding more electrons so the ionic radius blows up. Um, for most earth materials, uh, the coordinating anion is oxygen. Uh, so remember that oxygen is the most abundant uh, element in the earth that commonly takes a, a negative charge. So a lot of times we're talking about how, what is the ionic radius of some cation relative to oxygen. Okay, so the principle here is that as ions become more positive, fewer electrons, ionic radius will get smaller. Um, as the charge on the ion becomes more negative, you add electrons to it, then it will have a larger radius. So if you take vanadium, which can take a bunch of different valence states, uh, charges, um, which would have the largest ionic radius? And the answer is plus two. So as the charge gets higher and higher and higher, the smaller the radius. So vanadium plus five will have the smallest ionic radius. Uh, vanadium plus two will have uh, the, small, uh, the largest ionic radius. So at this point, um, I would hope that you could predict the relative sizes of two atoms from their positions on the periodic table, as well as the relative sizes of two ions in the periodic table uh, based, not, based basically on what kind of charge they're likely to take. Okay, now let's turn to coordination. Coordination is how ions pack together. Um, and so the number of ions that can pack around uh, an atom uh, is called the coordination number. And it's just a number, two, three, four, six, eight, and so on. And the coordination number depends on the relative sizes of the atoms. So if you've got a, a little teeny tiny atom, so this might be carbon plus four, and a couple of big ions around it, so oxygen minus two, then you'll form this uh, linear uh, molecule. So little teeny tiny ions will form this kind of structure. Now, if it's pretty small, then you can pack four uh, ions, large ions, around a smaller ion. This is called fourfold coordination, tetrahedral coordination. We'll come back to that. Um, as it gets bigger, you can pack more and more and more uh, of the larger ions around the, uh, the smaller ion. Now, if you look at metallic crystals, um, all the atoms are the same size. So if you're looking at iron, all of the iron atoms are the, are the same size. And so these um, atoms, they basically pack together until they touch. You know, it's like packing oranges as effectively as possible into a, into a drawer, uh, like in the drawer in your refrigerator, if you're putting apples in there or oranges or something like that. You wanna, you wanna pack them in as closely as possible and so you put them until they just touch, and they touch in such a way that they minimize the, uh, the extra space that's in there. So there are a couple different ways that, that you can do this. One is what's called cubic closest packing. Um, it's called, abbreviated CCP, cubic closest packing. Or sometimes it's called face-centered cubic, and that's because there's a, there's a form in here, a structure, that has this shape of a, um, of a cube and it has atoms on each of the faces 
of the cubes, one right in the middle, and so it's called face-centered cubic, or FCC. And this is true for uh, these, these kinds of elements. And then um, there's also hexagonal closest packing, and that's similar, it's just a, a different way of, of arranging the atoms. This is, this is typically what you see in like a honeycomb. Um, there's a, every three atoms you can, you can stick one in between. This is not so common. Um, these are uh, rather uncommon elements, um, but it does, uh, it does form uh, in, in certain structures. And what's interesting about this structure is that you get different sorts of void spaces, so different little holes in there. And, uh, and we'll come back to talk about this um, in, a, uh, in, in a later uh, explanation of all of this. But if you think about here, if you look at these A atoms here, and you stick an atom on top of it, so that would be the B atom, you have one, two, three, four atoms and so that's one kind of empty space. But if you have, there's another space in here. So if we put the Bs in here, B atoms in here, there's a bigger hole, which is right there, that has the A atoms, one, two, three, around it, one, two, three. But it's also got B atoms around it, one, two, three. And so that has, um, it's a larger space that has six ions packed around it. Um, so cubic closest packing, hexagonal closest packing, they're very uh, efficient at um, filling space. And so they fill about 74% of space. There are other sorts of uh, packing structures. There's body center cubic, and that um, fills 68% of space. And that's for a particular kind of coordination of iron. So these kinds of things become important if you're talking about metallurgy and you want to um, uh, talk about the, the structures of steel, for example. Okay, so now let's turn to um, the coordination number. And as I mentioned before, the coordination number depends on the relative size of the atoms or the ions. It's actually the ratio of the sizes of the atoms or ions. So if you've got a big, relatively big atom surrounded by larger atoms, then you can form this kind of structure where you have a lot of these green coordinating ions around the central ion here, the gray ion. And this kind of uh, structure is stable if the ionic radii are similar. If they're very dissimilar, then you'll get a different coordination of, uh, of ions. Okay, so the way that we predict the coordination of atoms is the radius ratio. It's the, it's the ratio of the smaller ion, the cation, uh, to the larger ion, which is the uh, the anion. And as you take a structure like this, so this might be stable with a big, relatively big uh, central cation, still smaller than the anions, but it's still pretty big as, as cations go. Um, if this ionic radius gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so you go to a different element with a different ionic radius, um, this structure will be stable until the radius of this ion gets too small to the point where it starts bouncing around in the inside of, of this structure. And if it gets too small, then um, this no longer becomes a favored structure, and it goes to a smaller structure where there are fewer of these big green anions packed around the, the smaller cation. And so here you're looking at a fairly large uh, cation. Here you're looking at a little tiny cation. And so here you only have three of these green anions packed around it, here you've got eight. Um, so normally, the cation radius to anion radius is, is less than one. Um, but there are instances where it is approximately equal to one. So potassium fluoride, not a very common compound in nature, but it is an example where the radius of uh, potassium and the radius of fluorine are, uh, are pretty similar. And if, if you get that kind of common uh, ionic radius, then you get uh, what's called 12-fold um, or dodecahedral uh, packing. So there's, there's 12 different uh, atoms around it. This turns out to be the same as hexagonal closest packing, cubic closest packing, like we were talking about before. If you actually look at that, and you look at one atom ion, there are 12 other ions around it. Now, if the radius ratio drops to between 0.732 and 1, 
then you get what's called cubic uh, coordination. Not cubic closest packing, that's a different thing. This is cubic coordination, and it's where, this is the one I was showing before, where there are these eight anions, they're on the corners of a cube, and there's a central cation right in the middle. So it's called eight-fold coordination, there are eight anions around it, and it's also called cubic coordination because the anions here form the shape of a cube. Um, as the cation gets smaller and smaller, then it switches to what's called six-fold coordination or octahedral coordination. And so here we go, this, this ion is, is now smaller, the gray one inside here. And so there are six anions packed around it, one, two, three, four, plus one at the top, one at the bottom. So these form a square with, a, with an ion sitting on top of the square, another one sitting on the bottom. There's, there's a point that can be a little confusing here. It's called six-fold coordination, but it's also called octahedral coordination. So octahedral, it means that the polygon that this forms has eight sides, which it does. There's four, one, two, three, four on the top, and there are four on the bottom, one, two, but three and four on the other side. But octahedral there means eight sides. It doesn't mean the number of ions. And so it, it, the octahedral coordination actually has six anions packed around the cation, not eight. Things get smaller, you, uh, uh, coordination switches to tetrahedral coordination. Um, and so here you've got a central cation with one, two, three, four anions packed around it. Here it is over here, one, two, three anions forming a little triangle. And then this anion sits down on top of it, just like this, one, two, three. And then this ion sits down on top of it. So that's called tetrahedral. That one's not so bad because the polygon has four sides to tetrahedron, four ions, uh, anions in the corners, tetrahedral. Smaller, then um, the coordination switches to uh, what's called a trigonal planar coordination. Trigonal just meaning that there are three uh, anions. So here we have one, two, three anions with a, with a little tiny uh, cation in the middle. This is really uh, common in the carbonates. This, this is the, the fundamental structure of the CO3 that makes up the carbonates like calcite and dolomite and so on. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned, if, it gets, uh, if the ionic radius gets really different, if, if, the, if it drops to a very low uh, ratio, then you end up with what's called a linear uh, coordination. So the little tiny cation is in the, is in the middle and you've got anions uh, on either side. So now here's just a, a table that has all of these uh, all of these terms, the radius ratios and the coordination numbers and the polygon name. So we started off with dodecahedral closest packing, uh, and then we worked our way up, 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 up to uh, to this configuration. Um, and so we went from dodecahedral, cubic octahedral, so on, to linear. So 12-fold, 8-fold, tetrahedral, 4-fold, 2-fold, so on. These are the ratios, the range of the ratios of the cation to anion that you would predict um, would adopt the, the linear, in this case, um, coordination. So if the radius of the cation to the radius of the anion is just, let's say, 0.1, then you would predict that that uh, coordination would be linear. If it's 0.25, you'd think you'd predict it's tetrahedral. If it's say 0.8, uh, you'd say uh, you would predict that it would be cubic. So let's uh, here. If you had a molecule with octahedral co configuration, um, what would its coordination number be? The the number of anions that are packed around the cation. And the answer is six, right? This is, this is the tricky one, where you, you see octahedral, you think eight. The polygon does have eight sides, uh, but the number of coordinating anions is six. Okay, so here's an example where we could calculate uh, the radius ratio and predict a coordination number. Okay, so here we're looking at a compound, TiO2. So rutile is an example of a, of a mineral with that composition. So here's our radius of titanium, four plus, um, 0.6 angstroms. Uh, angstrom is a unit of length. Oxygen, 2 minus 1.4 angstroms. 
Those are their radii. And so what would we do to predict the coordination? Well, we take the cation radius divided by the anion radius. Calculate that ratio, 0.43. And then we'd look up on the table to where we found the range, 0.43. And we'd see, okay, it should have six anions, six oxygens packed around the titanium. So it would take octahedral coordination. There's an abbreviation, we don't have to go into all of this, tetrahedral coordination is abbreviated T, and the octahedral coordination is abbreviated M. That's because metals typically take octahedral coordination. So this is what you would anticipate for the, the titanium oxygen uh, little sub structure that is in the rutile, uh, in rutile crystals, and that's exactly what it is. Rutile is made up of a bunch of TiO2, uh, a bunch of titanium, oxygen octahedra. Um, so the coordination number is six and the shape is an octahedron. So now let's do the same uh, little calculation, but let's do it with uh, two different salts. And I, I've drawn these, the, um, the yellowy green balls are uh, chlorine and the sort of orangey red balls are cesium and sodium over here, and I haven't drawn them to size. None, none of these are to size, they're just atoms, ions, sitting here in, in boxes. So the ionic radius of cesium is 1.67, and the ionic radius of sodium is 0 0.97, and the ionic radius of chlorine is 1.81. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the radius ratio. Okay, so 0 0.92 and 0 0.54. Cesium is much bigger than sodium. And so if we go back and we look at our table, we would predict that cesium chloride should be eight coordinated, so it forms a cube. And sodium uh, chloride should be six coordinated, so it should form octahedra like this. And this is why these two salts have different structures. Here's cesium chloride. So there's a cesium in the middle with chlorine on all four uh, corners of the top and the bottom of the cube. And then here's sodium chloride, here's sodium, and it's got one chlorine below it, one, two, three, four chlorines around it, and then there's another chlorine in the next, in the next layer up. So one, two, three, four, five, six. They're both cubic minerals. It's an interesting thing. They, they both form cubes, um, but they have different internal structures. One is an eight coordinated structure, the other is a six coordinated structure. Now, it doesn't always work this way, right? <laughs> There's exceptions to everything. Um, this concept is really based on ionic bonds. So you know, if an atom takes an electron or it gives an electron. Um, and, you know, that's not how bonds always work. Sometimes atoms will share electrons. And that can, that can change things uh, around a bit. But the way I usually approach thinking about mineral structures is, to, um, is really to think about uh, these kinds of coordinations and how they relate to ionic radii. And then it's also worth pointing out that there are other sorts of coordination uh, uh, numbers that are, that are possible. Um, so we talked about, what, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, and 12, um, but there are a bunch of other ones. There's nine-fold coordination in some minerals, 10-fold, five-fold, and, and so on. So it can get more complicated as you go to other minerals. But the, but the ones that we just talked about, especially tetrahedral, octahedral, and cubic, those are by far uh, the most common. Okay, and so as I mentioned before, the most common anion in Earth's crust and mantle is uh, oxygen. So a lot of times we're looking at coordination with respect to oxygen. And so if you look at some of the common cations, carbon, and this is working up the, uh, uh, the periodic, uh, not periodic table, ionic radius. Carbon four plus has the smallest ionic radius. Work your way up, 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 up. Calcium has a fairly large ionic radius. Potassium has a, a very large ionic radius. Um, and then these are the anions down here. Oxygen, the most common, also chlorine and sulfur. So if you just look at these cations with respect to oxygen, then these are the predicted 
uh, or well, these are the radius ratios. These are the observed uh, coordination numbers. And so uh, carbon, CO3, we would predict threefold coordination, forms that little trigonal plane. And that's what we would, uh, that's what we observe and that's what we would predict. Fourfold for silicon, T for tetrahedral. Aluminum is kind of in the middle there, uh, right between tetrahedral and octahedral, and it takes tetrahedral and octahedral coordination. And so on and so on and so on as you go up the, um, the ionic radii, then uh, in fact, the predicted coordination is commonly quite similar to the observed coordination. Okay, so quick, quick quiz here. So lead has an ionic radius of 1.19 angstroms and sulfur uh, minus two, right? Sulfur can be an anion. When it, when it is, it has an ionic radius of 1.84 angstroms. So what would you predict the coordination number of lead would be in galena? Okay, so this would be octahedral. If you divide these out, it's about 0.65. Run over here to the table, falls within this range, coordination number of six, octahedral coordination. So at this stage, I would hope that you could predict relative sizes of atoms from their positions on the periodic table, ion sizes, again, from the periodic table, um, so order the different polygons or coordination numbers from smallest to largest. So coordination number three is a, is a, is a smaller radius ratio than a coordination number of 12. Um, and then uh, be able to predict the coordination number or, or the polyhedron um, of a cation relative to its, to its anion if you were given the ionic radius of the cation and the anion, and you had the chart that relates the cation anion radius ratio to the coordination number and the uh, band polygon. Right, great.